This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. With all of the stressors of life and work, it can be so easy to get caught up in what everyone else needs from you and never take a moment to think about what you need from yourself. Between producing my favorite podcast, keeping up with the latest in Swam Thula's book nook, and helping Drac design and test extermination challenges, I spend a lot of time giving in my work life. That's why therapy is so important to me. Therapy gives me the tools to find more balance in my life so that I can keep supporting others and doing what I love without leaving myself behind. Therapy has helped me learn positive coping skills and has empowered me to be the best version of myself. When every day is literally Halloween in your world, it can be so helpful to have a therapy solution designed with your schedule in mind. If you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online and designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash brothers today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash brothers. Now from Hollywood, California, the horror capital of the world, the Boulay Brothers. Creatures of the night. Hello, uglies, and welcome to the podcast. We are finally back from our U.S. tour. Swan, how are you feeling? (laughs) To be honest, I feel fantastic. I mean, I feel so good after this tour and I know I shouldn't be surprised but I am a little bit because the S4 tour although glorious and fabulous for both us and the fans it was a lot of work sort of behind the scenes behind the scenes yeah the magic behind the curtain was so grueling so that's what I was preparing for you know I was ready to face that however this time we had such an amazing upgrade across the board with the crew that it just made doing our job so much easier and so much more clean and simple. So now I feel like I worked hard. We entertain crowds all over the country, all over North America, but I'm not completely soul drained. So what was it? So for fans that don't know, because obviously a lot of our fans don't go on tour and know what it's like behind the scenes. What's the difference between the last tour season four in terms of the behind the scenes stuff and this tour? Well, I think that, It's the way that the crew engaged with us as entertainers. And I think this year, the crew really did... I don't mean to sound... The crew uh, last year was a flop. The crew last year... They were a flop, they were a dud. This year were stars and last year were flop duds. No, but also yes. Why were they a flop last year? I think because they did not understand how to treat drag artists as stars. They acted like they were the stars, at least in a couple of of very real ways. I was like, this... Is, it, is she really, she's really doing this right now. And that's why she was not here again this year. Okay, but who and caught it? you know it who on, I'm talking and about. And who caught it on day one of You really four. did. You absolutely right? did. I, sn- I snorted that out. <laughs> yeah. Like right a truffle the in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I mean, I knew you it. called the meet, her out. When we all met up, I was like, this isn't going to work. And right. you all were like, don't be like that. Just be positive. I'm like, I don't need to be positive. I'm positive <laughs> when it's time to be positive. But sometimes I know and I just knew because, you know what? I just knew. Let's just put it that way. But this it, year, total different experience. Yeah. Love this crew. Oh, my God. I love the crew. I love Obsessed. I love Five Senses Reeling. Like, I love the cast, too. But because the cast was so good and the crew matched them, this tour was like a dream. The fans should think Obsessed. Because they have revitalized me and had made me want to tour again. When mm-hmm. I was questioning it after season four, I'm like, you know what? Uh, season five, people might have to be going on the tour on their own. <laughs> they might have to just go on without me and I'll just keep the percentage. But after this experience, I am revitalized and I want to tour again. And also I want to thank the fans because they were so excited to meet us and they gave us so much energy. Like we've talked about this too mm-hmm. before that, like after we do a season of the show, it's draining. It's so much drama to put up with and everyone's mental health and everything. I'm just like, mm-hmm. Oh my God, you know, <laughs> because we care, you know, we don't just check in for like a month and film and then forget them. We're like engaged for the whole process. So it's despite draining. what anyone might say, right? Despite what anyone 
might say, we really do care about, I think, everyone that has come across the Dragula stage. Yeah. And abs- continue to. Right. And so, to me, going this time and meeting the fans and having them give us all that energy, it made me want to do it again. Mm-hmm. It did. It did. And I also have to thank not only the crew and the fans, but our cast of stars who came with us because they were all fantastic. Literally Couldn't every single better. one of them. I mean, this was an experiment. We did what we said we were going to do. We're always pushing to make it a little bit bigger and a little bit better than it was the year prior. So this was the first year that we were actually able to bring everyone on the cast, minus Yavska because they weren't available. But everyone else was able to tour at least to some degree and sometimes to a great degree somewhere in the U.S. and somewhere in North America. And everyone that came on board brought it. They proved and showed again over and over why when you're cast on Dragula, you're cast because you are a star of the stage and you experience that drag on the tour live over and over. And they really brought it. I'm very proud of them. Moving on, we're back. Yes. I'm very excited to be back. Now, in lieu of what we just talked about and how... how Lou wasn't there. No, I'm talking about Luann. Like, oh. You know, the housewives. I thought you were talking about Louisiana. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Lou. We did get to see Miss Lou on the tour. Yes. The tour is so fun. Like, just to throw my two cents in, I love touring. Even when it was difficult, I love it. Like, I love just being able to engage with the crowds, put my blinders on, get on my bus, get in my coffin, and go and be a star and just show the world what Dragula offers on stage over and over, like rinse and repeat. I'm really excited that it was such a positive experience, and I'm excited to do it again. I'm excited to go to Australia. I'm excited to go to the UK, and I'm excited to do it again next year. Cool. Now, what were you (laughs) saying about in lieu of... No, I was saying in lieu of having such a positive experience on the tour, we're back in Los Angeles. We're fully engaged in pre-production on the next season of the Blade Brothers Dragula, and I feel fantastic about it. I just feel empowered and ready. I can't believe what we're creating. I'm so excited. I think people are going to be gagged. I think they're going to be gagged even from the first major change that we made that obviously we can't talk about. I'm excited. Are you? Gagged. (laughs) are you excited of course of course i am yes it's partially like a little nervous because it's always a little unnerving to change something that people love but i think it's more excited than nervous because the changes that are coming i think are just going to excite people further you're more excited than you are nervous about it yeah i think so for sure how about you good i'm not nervous at all really i'm not nervous at all i feel confident it's kind of like Long ago on a galaxy far, far away, when we first decided to start Dragula, right? Yeah. We, me and you, it was just me and you talking about it. Mm-hmm. And when we first started brainstorming about it, we were so excited. We were like kids. We were like kids who discovered like, yeah, I don't know what, the best thing you could ever discover. Yeah. We were so excited and it just felt right. You know that feeling. It just oh, felt right. Absolutely. And then we told all our friends and they tried to destroy it and said how horrible the idea was, right? And dissuaded us, which only made me want to do it more. And then we did it and it exploded and was so insanely successful that like their wigs were blown off down the street and they their faces were covered in black soot like a bomb went off. Disintegrated. Yeah. I feel like that about this. I feel like it's gonna be like that once again. <laughs> yes. But we're back. We're in pre-production. We're excited. We're going to go to Australia. So if any of our listeners are in Australia, you need to go buy tickets now because we're going to be in your country in about a week and a half. Yeah. So we will be there. I'm super excited about that leg of the tour. And when we return, we will be fully into production of the next season of the show. Yes, which is going to be great. We still have a lot of appearances we're doing coming up, too. We're doing a lot of horror conventions this year. So stay Mm -hmm. tuned to our social media because we're going to be coming to a lot of different cities and countries to spread the word of filth, drag, horror, and And glamour. I don't know how many like cats do we want to let out of the bag as far as like some of the changes that we have planned or should, None. We, should we leave it in the dark? We definitely should leave it in the dark. I think so too. I will say, well, there's one, there's one we can say. Okay. We're going to have a big, bad new set for the Boulay Brothers Dragula. Ooh. A new set. And it's going to be really exciting. All right. So another thing we did recently, we went to the Boogeyman premiere since the last podcast. We went with a friend of ours, David Datsmalchin who is actually in it, and it inspired us to review The Boogeyman for this episode. So we invited David to come on the podcast with us and review the movie and talk about his experiences making it. And Ian is not here this week because he is out of town for a family gathering. Poor thing. Poor thing. So David's (laughs) going to come in and review the movie with us, which I think is going to be lots of fun. For people that don't know, I think, enough about David Dasmalchin, we love him. You may recognize him as a guest on last season of The Blade Brothers Dragula. But just to tell people some background, 
He's an actor and a producer. He's been in a ton of movies that I'm sure you've seen many of. The Dark Knight, Suicide Squad, Dune, The Boston Strangler, Ant-Man, soon to be The Last Voyage of the Demeter. And he was also in Boogeyman. He's super involved in sort of all things horror. It's like if there's a cool horror role like or a horror movie or even horror adjacent he gets cast in he it. He does. He has like a dark gift. I love it. He does. He reminds me of like one of those kind of Christopher Lee's or Vincent Price back in the day, you know, when you'd see pictures of them and they're just in all the horror movies and mm-hmm. they're these sort of horror icons. I think of him as like an up and coming character like that. And I love it. Of course, we're great friends with him because of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And I love making appearances with, because it's not yeah. only David, it's David and his gorgeous wife and their friends and it, together, it's just like this. I feel like the monsters when we show up. <laughs> totally. But it also feels feels like you know when you see these pictures on like some of these like horror websites or twitters and stuff it's like Barbara Steele and Vincent Price back in show up on Hollywood Boulevard. No, no, not, yeah. but even in the movies backstage and stuff. Oh, sure, I sure. feel like we're kind of like a modern day version of that, like us and David and this group of people. It's kind of cool. I, feel, I told him, I was like, you know, when we're like 80 one day, we're going to be on some stage at a convention being like, back when we filmed Halfway to Halloween, <laughs> we had to go get our own snack. You know what I mean? It's going to be like some stupid shit like that. So totally. People are going to have to pay like $80 to get our autograph. And <laughs> oh, God. There'll be no line. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody cares. Terrible. Anyways, maybe we should take a quick break, right? I think so. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we will be reviewing The Boogeyman with the incomparable David Das Malchin and talking to him about what it was like to make the film. So stay tuned. This episode of the Belay Brothers Creatures of the Night is brought to you by BetterHelp. Trying to find a healthy balance between work and life can be difficult, even if you love your job. Working for the Queens of Darkness as the Renfield of Drag brings a ton of light to my life, but with all the projects we have going on at any given time, it can be easy to find myself spending less time on myself while giving more time and energy to work, which can make you feel stretched thin and burned out. That's why seeing a therapist is so important to me. Therapy can give you the tools to find more balance in your life, so you can keep supporting others without leaving yourself behind. While there are tons of amazing benefits of being in therapy, it's not just for those who have experienced major trauma. Therapy can help set boundaries in your work and personal life so that you can be the best version of yourself, an essential trait for ruling the underworld or just ruling your own world. If you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online and designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time with no additional charge. Find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com brothers today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp. H-E-L-P dot com slash brothers. Welcome back, uglies, and welcome to this episode's Creature Feature Movie Review, or as we like to call it, the Junior Men's Movie Club. Yay! And today, very special day, we're talking about director Rob Savage's new film, The Boogeyman. And we are joined by our dear friend and one of the stars of the film, David Dasmalch. And David, welcome to the show. Hello, my fiends. It's <laughs> so good and ghastly to be here with you. Thank you for having me on the show. But of course. I can't believe this is the first <laughs> time you're on the show. I know. Well, it, it was meant to happen. It needed to happen. And here it can happen all around the boogeyman. I'm so happy to finally be here talking to you both. Yeah. And we went to the premiere with you, which was fun. It was awesome. Thank you for being there. It was so so great when you have worked so hard on something and you care about something and the night comes to release it it's so nerve-wracking and you're surrounded by so many people you don't know there's agents and there's press and there's all these people so to have your family your friends the people that love and support you no matter what was so important to me and then to have you two show up and of course just bring it was <laughs> so awesome well it seemed like the coven was complete right when the it, when the limo doors opened yeah. and we all emerged it was like da, da, da. <laughs> like a storm cloud came over hollywood boulevard and it was just perfect did you see the way all the press i mean the disney folk like cleared everybody there's a big line of people to get to that red carpet and they saw that door open and you two stepped out first and they just cleared everybody they're like get them right on that carpet <laughs> i know it's true well thank you for having us it was truly delightful and you really handled the situation I think in such a svelte kind of like professional way, just like making sure everyone was taken care of. And of course you had your mind on 
the prize, which is like you kind of handling the red carpet moment, but you made us feel very warm and welcome. And of course you were taking care of everyone with us. So I think you did a great job. It's fun to see you as a star, right? Cause we know you as a friend uh, privately and then to see you sort of work it and do your thing. It's really charming. You, you're great at it. Thank you. It's all the feelings. It is all the feelings. You feel so excited. You're so proud. You're so um, you know, gr- grateful that you're getting to do this thing, which is make a horror movie and share it with people. And you're there on Hollywood Boulevard, but it's terrifying. My anxiety goes through the roof. And one of the biggest tools that I've put in my tool belt in recent years and working on my anxiety is making sure I'm surrounding myself with the people who I know have my back the people who love and support me and who are there for me so that if I fall apart or if I can't handle it, I can say, I'm so sorry, I have to go. Like I'm going to, and that would be there. And that's why when you were there with me and Eve and our friend Lee and we're going to the thing. I just felt so calm mm, and I, I felt love so grounded and I'm really proud. You know, I'm really proud of obviously our IRL friends, like outside of the business and outside of our creative collaborations. But I'm also really proud of like what we're doing creatively and as collaborators. And so it felt like it just was perfect to have you both there. And I'm looking down the aisle and we'll get into this, but I'm sitting there looking at my Dear sisters, one of whom is crying in horror (laughs) while the two of you are smiling as we're watching this movie unfold. It was so great. Well, it was kind of hilarious because your sister, is it Lee? Oh, no. uh, Holly and Heidi were sitting next to you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I think Heidi was sitting next to me and she kind of gave me a disclaimer before the movie started. She's like, how are you with horror movies? And I'm like, darling, I love horror, but I do get scared of everything, but I like it. And she's like, I get scared of everything too, but I also scream. I'm like, oh my God, will you be vocal during this? She's like, absolutely. (laughs) So she was like screaming and then being like, I'm so sorry. And I was like, you do not have to apologize. You're making this experience better for me. (laughs) Well, so it was Heidi sitting right next to you. She was in the leopard print pants. Holly was was next to her, yes. I believe. And then, yes, Holly's husband, Steve, was on the other side. So Holly, when I was a kid, was the one who would torment me with her version of the boogeyman at, at bedtime. She would tuck me in, she would make me feel safe, and then she'd leave, and then she'd start running her long fingernails down my door, <laughs> and she'd <laughs> creep in. So it was so twisted, and it was so effed up, but I'm sitting there laughing my ass off, watching her lose her crap because she was so scared. I was like, this is revenge. Well, that's all I, I mean, actually it's not all I heard because this experience and we'll get into this. The theater was like electrified. It was yes. electric. They yeah. were, it was they so were cool. reacting and it was, there was so much energy. It was laughing and screaming and like, you know, the, like the gas, the collective gas, which always makes a horror movie experience better. But consistently what I heard throughout was like, everybody was jumping and screaming and you were laughing. Like I just, <laughs> I heard your laugh like over and over and over, which made I, me laugh. I have a mean laugh too when I'm like <laughs> bullying like my bully laugh it like drives Eve crazy because she knows when I'm she calls it my naughty laugh like when I and especially when I'm teasing my sister Holly I love to tease her so much it's so fun because well, it's you know come up and here we are yeah, she, just, she deserves it she just totally <laughs> had it coming so what is it like okay so when you go you saw the movie obviously before the premiere and you have certain ideas of what you think is going to resonate with people and then you get there and you watch it with the audience and sometimes the reception like they laugh at different things or react to different things like were you surprised by their reaction to anything in the film? I try my very 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 best to eliminate all sense of expectation about what I th- hope an audience will do because I've had too many moments where I was expecting a certain thing to really pop or expecting a certain moment to really grab people. And it, and it didn't, it always shocks me and surprises me as the things that work. Mm -hmm. And which is in the big picture of my career, why process is so important to me and why I'm so selective about who I work with and why the making of the thing is as important, if not more important than the product, because then I'm sitting there in the theater. It's completely out of my control. I'm watching it. I will say, the biggest fear I had going in that night is my character is introduced. He immediately gets down to brass tacks and has to be delivering this really important information and data that's going to set up a mythology about a creature, about an entity, about a horror that is what this entire film is about. And if I didn't deliver it in a way that I felt like was a entertainingly engaging enough that people were paying attention, Mm -hmm. creepy enough that people might feel like on edge of like what, is about to happen with this guy. And also endearing, that might not be the right word, but there's something you try to do as an actor that makes people, even if you're doing something that's creepy or uh, whatever, that they still care. I want, Mm. I need, even when I'm doing villainous things, whatever it may be, I need people to 
care because then I think they lean in more, their hearts open a little more, their imaginations open a little more, and you can take them where you need to. So I was sitting there and I was trying not to think about it. It's funny that you asked that, but I, being completely honest, I was really like nervous that people would be like, you know, eating their popcorn, wrestling in their seats, yeah. like start talking to each other. Mm -hmm. And it really was, it was a very humbling and positive, great feeling for me to feel like there was a kind of stillness and that like people seemed to kind of lean in during that sequence. And as soon as that was over, <laughs> then I could like rest easy. I was like, okay, I didn't fail this movie. Yeah. yeah. Did you notice that it was silent? Like you commanded the attention. That's what I was telling you before we, we were recording that your character was so intense, but you cared about them too because of what all they had been through. I thought you delivered it perfectly. Thank you. I felt that too, right? The whole theater, people were shuffling at first and there was giggling at parts that not always happens in premieres that don't happen when you go see a regular, you know, a regular theater. But when you came on, the intensity was so, it like made the whole room go quiet. You did Thank great. You. Thank yeah, you. I, I get giddy too. Jack said it earlier, but I'm doubling down. Like, you know, we know you as a friend, maybe outside of like TV world and movie world. And then, okay, going to this experience, like, oh, you know, we get to see David on screen. And I am like a child. <laughs> yeah, I get like squirmy in my seat, you know, because I'm cheering for you regardless of what your performance is or not. But it was a great moment. And I think the character had that kind of, gravity I think needed to kind of deliver the mythology and it just set it up and then the whole movie overall I'm spilling the tea at the beginning here of the tea party but you know it was really fun it was like a great movie going experience so you're talking you. about being kind of choosy with movies so Rob who directed the movie is no most for host yes so were you like what made you attracted to working with him on this or were you a fan of host or I was a big fan of host okay. we went into the pandemic and it was one of those movies that stood out to me as something that I just discovered, I guess, because there was this buzz around it that yeah. I watched it like through what felt like a Zoom. I think I might have, the first time I watched it, watched it on a laptop. And then I watched it a second time on my TV because I really liked that movie a lot. I will say I didn't want to do the film when they first presented it to me. Last year was a pretty busy year for me as an actor. And the roles that I was given the opportunity to bring to life were very challenging, were very diverse, very very cool. It was really neat. And I was excited about it, but it was demanding and it was taxing and it was physically and mentally taxing. And when this script was sent to me by one of the producers, Dan Cohen, who's a guy that brought Stranger Things to life, he runs a company called 21 Laps. And he he said, you got to do this. And Rob really wants you. And I read it. I said, I don't think it's, I just, it, 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 when you see the movie, you'll understand. I am required to, like we said, deliver the mythology of the movie, but also like, I'm a dad. I am someone who has suffered through pretty intense bouts with mental illness and depression. And to go to this place, yes, it's all pretend. It's all make-believe. Trust me. I've had to chase people around, chop people up, shoot machine guns at people. I get it. It's all fake. We're pretending. But there's something that happens to my body when my imagination goes to places that my brain and my body have not yet rectified how to separate from one another. So I just didn't want to do it. And then... I met Rob at Dan's urging and I really just fell in love with the guy. He had so many great ideas and he spoke so eloquently about what he wanted to do with the film. And I watched a short film of his, which if anybody can track down out there, it's called Dawn of the Deaf. It's a zombie film that is so beautiful. And I, I loved it so much that I was like, okay, it's time. I'm going to do it. I want to do it. I'll do it. That's amazing. I'm gonna have to check that out. When you go, because that was such a dark place. It was like in the movie, and you were like I said, so believable. You kind of commanded the theater. So, what is it like to kind of do that on screen with so many people in the room? You didn't know Drac was gonna you. Barbara Walters, you did you? Oh. No, I'm just curious. <laughs> you, you want my tears, and I'll be no. happy to shed them. No, I'm, I'm, and I'm serious. It's something I think about a lot because. When I have to go to a place to convincingly convey emotional states of being to an audience, whatever that may be, whether I'm a ball of goo that is, you know, his body in the quantum realm can cause people to understand different languages, whether it's a sailor on a ship in the 1800s fighting Dracula, whether it's uh, an addict who's living uh, homeless, it's something that it's so funny. I have all these tools and skills that I've been developing now for decades as an actor, and I'm just getting started sometimes. I feel like I'm constantly learning new tools and tricks and ways to manipulate my voice, my body, my facial expressions, so that hopefully the camera and the audience ultimately will be tricked into believing that I'm really experiencing this thing that, I, that I'm pretending to be experiencing. 
the further I've gone on my journey as an actor and the more, whatever the word may be, I don't know if it's success or credits or whatever I've racked up. Now I can be more selective with the people who I'm going to put my trust into their hands. And those are the directors that I think can guide me into those places and do it really beautifully. And so you're surrounded by gaffers and electricians and prop makers and, and set dressers and costumers and makeup artists and sound people and ADs. That never bothers me. It's, it's the imagination. You know, I don't need to be like really in it. I don't need that. Because I think that all these tools I've been developing are the point of that. It goes back to my days doing theater in Chicago. I'm standing on stage to try to deliver a Tennessee Williams monologue, and there's an old lady eating candy in the front row. I can't stop and be like, this doesn't feel real because <laughs> you're eating your candy in the front row. She brought her uh, junior men's to yeah, Tennessee and, Williams. And they did every matinee, I assure you. There was always some BS. But the funny thing is, like I said earlier, and I'll say it again, I'm trying to figure out the next level of work that I want to achieve is this, my body doesn't know the difference. Mm -hmm. My body so can, all of our bodies are so connected to our minds and our mental health and our physical health are so intertwined. And so for me, I was sitting in therapy at one point going through a really hard shoot and, and we were on Zoom, we were in Australia and Eve and I were talking to our therapist who we love, we've been taught, we, God, she's ugh, amazing ally for our lives. And I said, Darlene, the therapist, she said, uh, how is this role that you're doing? Is it, you know, how, do, how is it affecting your mental health? And I was like, oh, I'm offended. Darling. I'm an artist. I know how to turn it off. I hang up my costume. I take off my clown makeup and I go home and I am David at home. And Eve, like her Long Island eye roll was so loud. She looked at me like, are you, who are you kidding? Other than yourself. <laughs> yes. Right? Yeah. It lives in my body, and it's scary, and it's hard, but that makes it exciting, right? Mm. Yeah. Can you turn it off like that, like when you're done with the scene? Is it just like it's off, or does it take you a minute? To me, it does. Okay. To me, I and that is the goal. Maybe sometimes I slip. Maybe sometimes I get a little lost. We were making the film Prisoners in 2013, and I was on, in one moment where I got a little lost. We were making a film called Animals that same year in Chicago. I got a little lost. There's been a couple of other incidents in my career where I feel like I got lost, but generally not for longer than a few, maybe seconds, minutes, where then I could get back to, cause it's part of my job, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's really important that like, let's say we get it really great on a take, but the gel wasn't right on the light. The focus was off on the camera. Oh God, my really job is to get right back to A, and then go through the steps to get to A, B, C, D, E, F, G, because we landed so awesome on L, that part of the scene. But you have to go back to A to start it over again. So they're going to clean the tears off your face. They're going to reset you. The energy is there. That's my job. And yeah. if you're directing me and you're like, that was so good, David, but we want to change the camera angle. Let's do it again. Or whatever your reasoning is. And you're like, David, we got to do it again. We got to do it again. That's my job. It's right. exhilarating and it's kind of fascinating, right? And it's also kind of exhausting. And I think we can relate in some ways because we've done some work in front of and behind the camera, but to kind of go through those motions and churn that stuff up and then be like, actually, there was something wrong with the mic. And, you know, that you're doesn't just in these unseen me. things. But, you know, to repeat it, sometimes you're like, oh. For me, it's being it's on the other side. And if like we've had to do like these enraged scenes before and then the crew around us and I'll stop and I feel like they're buying it too much. And I'm like, oh, great. Now, OK, I guess I'll sit somewhere else at lunch. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> <laughs> it's a little too believable. <laughs> um, sorry. So, OK, let's talk about the movie as a whole. So do you all think this was as successful as a horror movie and why, if so? Well, I'm obviously very in the middle of it all, yeah. so it's hard to have an objective opinion about it, but mm -hmm. completely subjectively, because I love you know the experience of the people around me, even though it was hard, I really find it to be a successful horror film. I think it's the kind of movie that people are going to go sit in the cinema, which it's so great to be back in the movies. You're back in that dark theater. Mm -hmm. You're back there with your friends on a Friday night, and there's strangers in the row in front of you, and everybody screams and then can laugh. And it just delivers the goods, in my opinion. Like, you're going to go and you're going to be talking about, you know, oh, my God, when that little girl and that closet door opened and we heard that thing scurry 
people were like, oh, you, I love that moment when people, there's at least one person in the theater is like, no, 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 no. <laughs> and it, it was your sister right yes, next to me. Yes, it was. It was Holly. <laughs> well, that's what I liked that it was fast, right? It didn't make you wait forever to get to the yeah. scary stuff. It really oh, came. We got there. In yeah, we got to the scene, business. Yeah. How about that opening scene with that poor baby? So yeah. I wanted to ask Let's you that. What there. did you, they went there. Which they usually, went there. Yeah, what did you think of that when you saw it? Well, the crazy thing is that's my character's baby. Yeah. And oh, it's yeah. my voice going, Daddy's here. If you listen, what Rob did that was beautiful with the sound designers of the voice of the boogeyman is they utilize the characters' voices that are in the environments of the places mm. where they are to gain the trust of their victims, yeah. to mess with the minds of their victims. And so the baby's like up, and then you hear like, Daddy's here. Dad. Eve walked out almost out of the screening room at Disney when they first showed us the movie. She was like, I can't, I can't, wow. I can't. She's like, they're not going to hurt a child, are they? I was like, no, of course not. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> that well, that's why I also thought that your character was going to become the boogeyman because sure. the voice, and then me later, of course, like uh, Sophie's character, yeah. they use her voice too. Yes. You know? So, yes. but at first I was like, no, wait a minute. Is that oh, going to yeah. be, yeah. But I, yeah. Love, I love it when they're willing to go there, especially the rating of this film is PG-13. This does not feel like a PG-13 no, movie. This no, definitely no. this definitely drives into the R lane too. Oh, these are I adult for sure scares. It was. Yeah, yes. my take on it very satisfying as a monster movie, but also kind of like something psychological, like a psychological roller coaster that we've all sat on at some part in our childhood. Mm -hmm. There were so many moments where I'm like, oh God, this is tapping into a well that yes. maybe I haven't drank from in so many years. But I think everybody can relate to those moments of super fear as a child when like the most formidable weapon is your own imagination mm -hmm. and you use it on yourself. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that happened like over and over and over and it was so good. I think so too. And the sound design, I love like the crunching and the bone, like, cause there's some stuff that's happening off camera. And so what it leaves to your imagination as a viewer is really disturbing and unnerving, like the sounds of bones breaking and flesh tearing. I was grateful that they went there. I think there are certain cardinal rules that they say you can't do in film. And I love when filmmakers are willing to break those rules. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're off to the races. And like you said, A, you hear Dave Desmolchins in a movie called The Boogeyman. It's like a no-brainer. Well, duh, he's the boogeyman, right? <laughs> like, I, I, I get it. Like, I get it. I am a cre creepy guy, and I play a lot of creepy roles. And I think that was kind of a wonderful thing in the casting of this, that they wanted me to play the role because I needed, in the performance of Lester, to hopefully set the audience on edge in a way that they're like, what is this guy up to? And I wanted Chris's character as well, who plays the therapist and the yeah. father of this family, to be like caring enough about this complete stranger that he would let him sit and talk, but also on edge enough that he'd be like, oh, I made a very bad decision. So without giving any big spoilers away, I'm hoping as you're starting to really settle into this movie and, and watching, you're gonna start being surprised by what you think is going to be the place that the boogeyman is going to pop out or who is going to be the boogeyman or what the boogeyman is going to be. And it's going to keep kind of shocking you. What did you think, Drac? I thought it was very successful as a horror movie, mostly because there's a lot of good scares in it. And I felt like within the first, was it 10 minutes or something, you were on edge, right? Because you, he, when, when Lester disappears into the house, mm. Everyone can relate to that, right? You're like, oh God, it's it's over. You know, yeah. like that's your biggest dread, right? For something like that to happen. And then when the daughter, you know, gotta keep spacing her Sophie's character, character, Sophie's character, Sophie's character yeah. is going uh, into the Sadie. mom's uh Sadie is going into the mom's art studio and hearing those like that to me, that's terrifying. That's mm -hmm. like much worse than a ghost or anything like that. Like someone in there, you don't know what's happening, you're hearing these noises. So I thought it was very successful because it legitimately kept you on edge and kept you scared. I am surprised it's PG-13. Yeah. Yeah. There were so many moments, too, that I felt like it was handled in a surprising way. Like, for example, I think one of the first times we get introduced to the presence of the boogeyman, we may not see the boogeyman at the time. You know, the closet is a vehicle that the yes. boogeyman lives, you know, in the darkness, whether that be under the bed or in the closet. In this case, it was the closet. And the doorknob starts to turn in a very... <laughs> slow kind of way and the child's eyes like gets bigger and you expect that creep factor to come out and then it slams open and it's whoosh, under the bed and every and all of a sudden you are that child on the bed like <gasps> like yeah. oh my god what what yeah. what has just happened and it, it's just sort of like the opposite of the way you think it would go and i think that was a good kind of example of how your expectations are kind of flipped sort of throughout yes it's really interesting too for me right now being the dad of a 9 and almost 6 year old who have their versions of 
the boogeyman. You know, my daughter, Penny, is not terribly often, but often enough calling me into her room at night. Sometimes she just wants to hang out, but sometimes it's like, I'm like, no, she's legitimately scared right now that like there's something in her closet and then I have to talk her through like, well, what does that mean? Same with Arlo. Arlo has had always different kinds of like fears of nighttime and the darkness. And so we've, you know, had friends do paintings to keep him safe and he's got mantras that he says. It's interesting in talking to the kids, it took me back to being a kid. And like you're saying, the movie does that in this really cool way where you all of a sudden remember what it was like when Mm -hmm. you were a kid and you thought the edge of your bed was like this total danger zone and you were so afraid to peek over the edge. (laughs) I had a closet too that like had another mini closet within it because we lived in this old house in Kansas and I was in the attic. So it was my closet, but inside that closet was a mini closet that led to the attic. Okay, that is the stuff that's that's horror. (laughs) And and if you open up, there was no light in there. It was just darkness. By the way, very brief sidebar, but Arlo and Penny say hi, and they're very, very mad at both of you for (laughs) not including them in the opening sequence of the Boulay Brothers Halfway to Halloween special on Shudder. They weren't in the dancing sequence. They weren't in the dancing sequence or in the uh, the, The the character intro, the the opening credits. Yes, and um, and and Arlo came up to me the other day, and he goes, Somebody made a mistake. And I said, I'm sorry, <laughs> what? And he goes, somebody made a mistake and I think you should talk to Drak and Swan. I said, okay, what's up? And he goes, I'm not on IMDb. <laughs> oh. oh, I love it so much. Yeah, I've created monsters. Be like, well, here's your first lesson. You have to pay someone a lot of money to do that stuff for you and then fans will fuck it up anyway. <laughs> And change it all around, and you have to pay someone to fix it again. Over and over. over Welcome over. to Hollywood, kid. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the question I was going to ask you about, because there, you know, the boogeyman typically torments, or you know, the, what we think of as boogeyman typically torment children, right? Yes. But in this movie, it's tormenting adults too. Right. What did you think of that concept? Equal opportunity monster. Equal yeah. opportunity monster. I'm a grown up. I live. I don't have uh, such a literal. Boogeyman is the metaphor that represents, I, I believe, uh, in, from King's, you know, source material all the way through the script in the film that Rob made, the manifestation of grief and loss and, you know, unresolved or untreated trauma. But I do live with uh, my boogeyman. I have a very strong visual metaphor that I, you may think sounds crazy, but I feel like I see sometimes I am 21 years clean and sober as of a week and a half ago, and I will still Sometimes when I feel pushed to the edge, there's a presence that looms in the backyard. Sometimes I've seen him like sitting in a tree, just kind of rocking back and forth. Now, again, I'm not saying I literally see this, but it's so powerful and real in my imagination because my imagination is such a huge tool for me in the way that I try to manage my mental health and my recovery. And sometimes it's like this all almost Vanta black mm-hmm. figure with kind of crispy skin that's just kind of rocking, waiting patiently, or standing like very, always very casually and confidently mm-hmm. down the hall with this energy that says to me like, just waiting for you. Oh, I'm just you waiting for you. I do, yeah. and it is so heavy, that's a great word because it's almost like a gravitational pull and I am surrounded by light, like as, as darkly monstrous as you two are, your lights in my life, Eve, the kids, all of our friends, you, you know my circle. Yes. Yes. Yep. We are surrounded by, and I do that as much because that's the beauty of life and that is important to me and I love that, but also for self-preservation. It's yeah. very intentional. I do, and I, and I and as well. I work you know, on a daily basis to maintain my mental health. And I've always gravitated towards the werewolf monsters, the metaphor of the werewolf and lunacy, if you will, Mm -hmm. and the fear that I have because it's generational in my family, but like mental illness and people who've quote unquote lost their minds, people who've gone lunatic, Mm -hmm. and I've been on that other side of it. So there's something inside of me even that I'm like, well, what is the, if it's not a full moon, is there some life event that could happen that could push me into that space? And the truth is, sure there is. None of us are infallible. All of us are vulnerable. And that's why we have to continue to do the work, you know? And I think, you know, we 
we kind of joke about us all being around darkness because we all are, in, you know, into horror and all these things. But I really <laughs> think joke. of it. I'm, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I think of it more as like a deepness than a darkness to me because okay. you sort of face hardships and these challenges that yes. maybe not everybody does, right? right like right. if you come from a damaged place or you live through hard times or dark things, I think you have to examine your mind and go deep in ways that maybe a common person doesn't have to. And we're safe, right? Like we are together in that space and there's hundreds of thousands of people out there who relate and can connect to it, which is also really important. So it's like you're crafting and creating worlds with the power of your skills and imagination to mm. like invite people in to go on these journeys, stories, but we're also the same people who thought it was hilarious to make a video of like my children strangling and cutting people up and cooking them. In a Which, by yeah, the way, the well, <laughs> there is that. There is that part. We too. got, we got, we got some notes from the family on that one. <laughs> oh, I think Eve was telling us like somewhere someone was like, I don't think this is funny. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't yeah, get yeah. where these Boulay brothers are coming. Yeah. Her dad, her dad apparently was like pretty traumatized by the easy bake <laughs> cremation oven, which is great. Cause guess what? That's fine. Our kids think it's great. I think it's hilarious. I do have a very, very dark sense of humor sometimes. Yeah. And life is morbid. Life is grotesque. Life is filled with so much that is so hard. And if we can't, I mean, it helps me. It's therapeutic yeah, it's to like laugh cathartic. at it. I we think need, so too. We need, to, we need to be able to talk about it and joke about it. And drag kind of is part of that too, where we can talk about these difficult issues and like laugh at them together, make light of it. Cause that's how we persevere. But through there's no it. cruelty. There's a difference. If we were, if we were making that bit and it was like a kind of like cruelty in it. It just, it doesn't work to me. That's when it right. slips over to this other side of stuff that you see on like these, you know, YouTube phenomenon. Sometimes I watch a thing and I'm like, I don't really jibe with that. Yeah. Because yeah. It feels well, cause we're almost turning the victim into the aggressor. So it's like, that's why I think we're comfortable with it. Cause it'd be different if the parents were doing it to young children. Yes. We had Felissa killing people. They were teenagers, which everyone hates teenagers. So that's <laughs> yeah. fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wrote something recently. I had a really, uh, there's an artist I love and admire, and I can't wait to share this with you. It's something that will be in comic book form soon. And my kind of crescendo involved the equivalent of like a, you know, a, a bigoted kind of human monster really tormenting people that we love and that we know need protection right now. And to me, it was the horror of that. And this artist who I just love was like, is there any way we could subvert that and actually land on that person being consumed or eaten by these people that he's torturing? Because I'm just... They, we, they get enough power in real life and we see them enough on the news scaring us with their weaponry or their words or whatever. And yeah. I feel like that's what I love about two the worlds that you create and that I think we want to share together. The world is populated by monsters. There are good monsters. There are bad monsters. We have to protect the good monsters and we have to stand up against the bad monsters. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's one of the things we do even subtly in the Dragula mythos is like we always, you know, at female presenting have these sort of almost naked male servants that we kill and dismember and treat sort of like nothing, which you usually find the opposite way around, right? Of in, the, in the world of horror, you usually see women as being subjectified. Yeah. And, and so up and I was just, yeah. it's a subtle thing, but it's one that I just like to kind of, I like to know when people see that on screen and that it makes them uncomfortable and they're not sure why it's kind of, sexual too like yeah. there's something I'd li I like that I love yeah. that you use the adjective subtle yeah <laughs> <laughs> well a lot of people don't always no, they I see know. it in the background and they're like but as soon as I started watching that? your show I was like oh, they are so smart like every little thought that you put into all the stuff it's so great thank I you love thank it. you so much I mean I'm excited for what we'll sort of do together in the future too the halfway to Halloween was so much fun and thank mm -hmm. you again for being a part of that you were yeah, so, that so invaluable great. and everyone who's listening I'm sure you've seen that before but if you haven't you have to go on shutter you have to watch this I'm so proud of the fact that I got to be a part of it with the both of you and that to see this vision you know come to life and how many people it's connected with and spoken to is like it's it's such a great feeling to me. I love it. Thank you. I feel me like too. we couldn't have done it without you, and it was so fun to do. So the last thing I want to ask you about, the boogeyman, right? Yeah. So I kept thinking that Lester was going to become the boogeyman, which I think, as I said, would have been even more scary. So seeing as how the movie will probably be a big success, do you think there's any chance that we could see the character again? So there we are. Here's the way my mind works. Mm -hmm. For everyone listening, the night was magical. We met at the hotel. Both of you showed up 
incredible. I was there. Eve, my wife, made this amazing dress. She looked, she looked insane. Stunning. You all look great. Yeah. Uh, our friend Leah looked incredible. The five of us go over there. We met with a bunch of our friends and family who were waiting for us at the movie theater. We watched this movie. Then we go to the party. And the party's a night to celebrate and just be like, okay, we're together. But immediately, I'm like, my wheels start turning. And I'm like sitting there talking to like the president of the studio. And I'm talking to the director and these producers. And I was like pitching my ideas. So the answer to that question is yes. <laughs> Good. Of course. You are so I smart. I love your mind. <laughs> see the way this could be such a great, there's a world that's like, there's prequel, there's there's sequel, there's all kinds of reality for this, but I, um, yeah, you know, I can't help myself. <laughs> uh, I hope to see that happen. It was Absolutely. so funny at the party because we got in there and there was people there that we wanted to talk to and I literally... The, I told you, those contacts that we wore that night, which we usually wear the whiteout ones, those were brand new that we were saving for the season. I was like, let's put them on because they're not so weird looking and it'll be fine. Not so weird. Well, you know, it's, it's the white stuff. It pops, no, I know. You know yes. like, yeah, I that's going to look a little too Halloween to go to this thing. So anyways, we go there and I'm like, I can't see. I was like, I can't see a fucking thing to him. And he said, just shut up. Let's go. It's fun. I'm like, okay, whatever. So we go in the room and it's, it was so dark in that. It was that so after dark party. in the Roosevelt. Like, yeah. yeah. I'm screwed. I oh, was yeah. like. Literally, yes. Sophie walked up to us like, hey, I'm, I'm like a fan of you all. I want to talk to you. And, and I didn't even realize who, because I couldn't see. <laughs> but that's not surprising, because Drac <laughs> never recognizes anybody. People, even, even people we know, they'll walk away and she's like, wait, who no. was that? I was no. like, please uh, get me out of here. I'm just going to weird everybody out. I cannot see or register anything. But yes. it was so fun Look, anyway. All that stuff is true. But the, real, <laughs> the most important thing was how the interior of the Roosevelt, that party room was so opulent and our look just went perfect. It went right with it. <laughs> you looked perfect I in mean, there. Yeah. It was ideal. And it was neat for me because there's a lot of my horror, my friend, most of my friends, obviously, we share a similar love for horror. But, you know, my buddy Jeremy Slater was there who created The Exorcist and so many great shows, Moon Knight, et cetera. And both of you and um, Mike Flanagan and Kate Siegel were there and they're mm -hmm. such monster minded people and everybody who thinks about this stuff and loves this stuff like we do was so excited. And I'm so excited for everybody who's listening to get to see this movie. I want to hear all of your thoughts because I think it's going to speak to a lot of us. A lot of us have suffered through trauma. A lot of everybody has suffered through the loss of someone we love and how you process that and learning how to talk to people about your feelings. It may sound cheesy and uh, whatever. I'm kind of a cheesy guy sometimes, but it's really important for us to talk, especially when we're in a dark place and we're suffering. And I think this movie really says that in a neat way. So. No, uh, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And even if you find yourself outside of that circle and you just love a horror movie with great scares and really good, like a really good monster movie, because I could appreciate it just on that level. Totally. Like gratuitous amounts of actually seeing the boogeyman creeping around the back of your mind, creeping around the back of your house. And how many times I was like, literally found myself like ooh like I was so like I was like really fascinated by some of the stuff that happened in there it was impressive it was surprising and I would watch it again yay all right, well, that's all the time we have for this episode's Creature Feature Movie Review. If you want to go and check out The Boogeyman for yourself, you can see it playing in theaters now and let us know what you think. David, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and we'll you. see you probably later tonight. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. It's time to dig into our haunted mailbox and answer all of your listener questions. Remember, if you have a question you would like us to answer on air, you can write to us at creatures at bouletbrothersdragula.com. Our first question is from Scott in San Francisco, and Scott writes, Evil Dead Rise review? Question mark. Did I miss it? Did you all talk about Evil Dead Rise on the pod? You have to have seen it. I need to know what you think. Swan, I think this is directed <laughs> right at your forehead. Well, considering I think to date I'm the only one of the three of us that have actually seen it, but I don't know if I said this on-, on You promised. I did. I, I probably said it, right? Yes. Like, we're such oath breakers. Like, we say things and then we- You. Oh, you too. You. 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 Not me. You. How dare you? Yeah. I, I think it was ambitious to say because- 
we went on a field trip during the tour. Like we were in Chicago and I think we had an afternoon off. So me, Vicky, Elise from the crew, Hoso and Hoso's partner all went to go see Evil Dead Rise. And I'm like, ooh, this would be a really great little secret, like additional podcast episode. Well, unfortunately, we didn't get time to record it. So I'll just say my abridged version and my personal review. Is that what we're asking for right now? I think you should still do the review with Vicky as a little added bonus episode. Okay, so... This episode will come out, and then maybe somewhere in the interim before the next one, yeah. I'll try to get a recording because Vicky can just record it from Orlando and I can be in Los Angeles. Right. Because we can do that with modern technology. But I do want to say this as an installment of the Evil Dead franchise, it was really fun. If you love Evil Dead, you will love this movie. And it actually expands the world of the Necronomicon and like books from hell and flesh golems and crazy death scenes, a ton of iconic stuff. I will review with Vicky. Bill from Miami asks, if you could reimagine a classic sitcom into a modern horror, which one would you pick and how would you change it? Wow. Have you had time to think about this one? I have. (laughs) (laughs) How did I know? Because (laughs) you know I love those old sitcoms. Obviously, look at Halfway to Halloween. I love all that old stuff. Totally. The one that I would redo is Alice. It would be Mel's Diner, and it would be Alice, and they would be cannibals. And that's all I'm going to say. We've talked about this as a concept. I don't want to say any more about it because it's probably going to (laughs) happen. You know what? That's the only answer. I want it. I want it bad. That is the only answer. Lillian asks, I know you like to keep things private and thickly veiled in mystery, but would you ever consider writing an autobiography? If not in the near future, perhaps one day revealing more about your pasts. Yes, I would do that. I'd probably wait quite a while to do it because I have to say, I think if people heard what our real life was like and what our struggles were like growing up and what our struggles were like getting our shows and stuff and and just building Mm -hmm. our careers, I think they would be shocked. I think they would be shocked and I think that they might see us in a different light. On that note, the question actually goes on and you've already kind of touched on it. Hearing more about your origins as artists and the creators of Dragula would be so valuable and insanely inspiring. It couldn't have been easy establishing the empire you reign over today and we're dying to know more. Yeah. I mean, that is the truth. There are real struggles. There are real big bad monsters in Hollywood who tried to come for us and like stomp us and it's a matter of like, survival and sometimes some magic and just real belief in yourself and like fighting what could seem like an insurmountable pull, you know, like undertow. There's two things. If I could give people words of wisdom, you need tenacity like you wouldn't believe. And I don't mean, I don't mean a little bit. I mean, you need to be able to get your face beat up like Lottie did in yellow jackets (laughs) multiple times and still get up. And I mean that in a metaphorical way because Hollywood will beat you up and, and, And you're not a victim. It's not because you're a victim. This is just the game. This is the system that you have chose to jump into. So it is what it is. And it's not that hard for everybody, but it might be that hard for you. And if it is, you got to be able to deal with it. That's my first bit of advice. And then my second bit of advice would be don't burn bridges. Don't burn bridges. Don't attack people ahead of you, behind you, to the side of you. Mind your business. Mind your business. Because I'll tell you one thing. People that burn bridges and people that sort of try to attack other people to get ahead, they never win. You can never win when you're dirty and you never will. And I just think that's a motto that I live by. And also. (laughs) And furthermore. And in closing. I do want to say this. (laughs) One day, I would like to sort of share the reality of what's happened with and around the show. You know what I mean? Because I think a lot of people talk a lot of stuff about the show and it sort of goes unchallenged, right? Because mm-hmm. it's just gossip and hearsay and everything. And I right. think it's just, you don't get dirty like that. You don't answer to things like that. But one day I would love to say what really happened because I think it would blow people's minds. Michael from Australia asks, what do you think about the Scream Queen trend? And out of the up and coming Scream Queens, Mia Goth, Anya Taylor-Joy, Jenna Ortega, etc. Who is the most impressive? Is there a Scream Queen trend? I I mean, maybe we have like a new kind of like generation because we've relied as horror does. It kind of like reuses content over and over and over. Jamie Lee Curtis over and over again, (laughs) like for a thousand years. 
but <laughs> now, <laughs> a little now, frustrated. <laughs> you're like Michael Myers, die. <laughs> But yeah, I think there's a like horror is having such a moment in this. I'd say this last decade, it's quite a long moment. And maybe that just has given us the opportunity to kind of find new people that we would consider scream queens. So do you like? Out of the ones named, I think Mia Goth really does stand out as like the performances, the role choices, like she's just special, I think, yeah. among this group. Uh-huh. But someone that has kind of sprouted up and I think in a way that's like, Unexpected is one of the stars of Yellow Jackets and now one of the stars of Boogeyman, Sophie Thatcher. Yeah. Who we had the pleasure of like meeting in person. And the truth is like their mystique on camera is just as powerful as in person. And I think we might have like a really powerful scream queen in the making. I like her. She, she's the, she's a little cool. bit of an underdog. Yeah. She's cool. She has like a cool energy to her. I guess it's hard to kind of root for Jenna Ortega at this point because she just keeps getting everything, which yeah. of course makes someone annoying, right? It's like, they're, they're, that's great for you. <laughs> great. Hooray. Another win for another huge role. Right. And I'm like, fantastic. <laughs> like that character. We I can't don't, like you now. We can't like you. I don't relate to you. Nothing in my life relates to that character. I like the underdog characters. I like the yeah. scrappier characters. I like the Mia Goths and I like the Sophie Thatchers. I agree. And I think Mia Goth is a good, ch- I'm into her. I, I'm yeah. into what she, what she's doing right now. Me too. Tom from Philadelphia asks, my question is about the halfway to Halloween special, specifically the scene where Swan transitions into that deadly nightwear outfit. Ooh, was that the outfit that was meant to be the reveal look for the Boulay's green nightgown look from the Titans episode seven? Wow. It is. I can't believe. Uh, yeah. Uh, Tom, you, I mean, this you is. You got it. Yes. That, yeah, we were supposed to. Ding, we ding, were ding. Have that robe on and <laughs> yeah. then open it and be in that outfit. Why did we not yeah. do it? I forget. I don't. There was something about the set that day or maybe it was just. I don't know. Maybe it was just, it was too deadly. It was too gorgeous. I don't know what it was. We didn't want to do that to Dali and say, I don't know. Um, (laughs) Yeah, because I have my set too. And I actually love it. We got that in Europe when we were on the season four tour in the UK. Your sleuthing skills are unmatched, Tom from Philadelphia. You are correct. Well, that's all the time we have for this episode's Creatures of the Night. Remember to subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you listen. And make sure you go specifically to Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and review. If we don't get 100 more reviews by next episode, we will not record another episode. Thanks, uglies, and see you next time. Maybe do what you're told. The Boulay Brothers Creatures of the Night is hosted by the Boulay Brothers with their co-host and producer, Ian DeVogler. Engineered and mixed by Carlos Bueno with music by Neuron Spectre.